What does it take to be a national hero? The list of distinguished people in France's rich history is a long one. Well, there are authors and philosophers, military heroes and resistance, politicians, cutting edge inventors and scientists, record breaking athletes, and of course, ordinary everyday citizens. So how does the nation show gratitude and respect for its great men and women? Join us as we investigate France's top honors. Located in the heart of the French capital, the Pantheon is now the symbolic home for France's national heroes. At first, though, it was supposed to be a church. Well, by the time its construction was finished, the French Revolution was underway. And so the new National Constituent Assembly voted in 1791 to transform it into a mausoleum, the ultimate recognition for distinguished citizens, modeled on the Pantheon in Rome. Since then, the remains of dozens of great men and women have been buried in the Pantheon. It's called Pantheonisation, and it can only be approved by the French president. You know you've made it as a French national hero when you're in the Pantheon. The select list includes Enlightenment philosophers Voltaire and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, groundbreaking authors Victor Hugo, Émile Zola and André Malraux, as well as the resistant Jean Moulin. So as you can see, a lot of men. In recent years, though, there has been a push to get more women into the Pantheon, the latest being American-born French entertainer turned resistant fighter and a civil rights activist, Josephine Baker. The inscription outside the Pantheon says, to the great men of the grateful nation. However, a growing number of women have received state recognition, sometimes long overdue. Josephine Baker, the first woman of color to be entombed in the Pantheon, joins the ranks of esteemed citizens, such as Simone Veil, the health minister who championed France's legalization of abortion, Germaine Tillion and Geneviève de gaulle Antonioz, heroines of the French resistance, as well as the groundbreaking physicist and chemist Marie Curie, the first woman interred on merit. Entombment in the Pantheon isn't always a matter of consensus, however. There was a recent debate over whether to include poets Rimbaud and Verlaine, who had a tumultuous love affair. A petition claiming they deserved the top honor for their genius and the homophobia they endured drew support from intellectual circles all the way to the Minister of Culture. But Rimbaud's family opposed it, saying he'd only be remembered for the scandalous affair, and ultimately the president followed their wishes. Some argued they were too rebellious for the Pantheon anyway. But the debate is proof that entombment in the Pantheon carries a political message and therefore rarely gathers unanimous support. Now, you may have heard of one of France's other top honors, la Légion d'honneur. It's one of France's most famous symbols of state recognition and the highest French order of merit, whether military or civilian. The Legion of Honor was created by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1802. Its motto is honneur et patrie honor and homeland, and it's divided into five degrees of increasing distinction. You've got the chevalier, the officier, the commandeur, the grand officier, and the grande croix. Les Grand Croix is really the crème de la crème of honorees. It's the distinction that's given to French presidents. And in fact, the French president becomes the grand master of the order of the Legion the year he or she is elected. Now, technically, membership to the Legion is reserved to French citizens, but foreign nationals who have served France or uphold its values can also receive the award. Now, that was the case of the American and British passengers who stopped a terrorist on a TALIS train between Paris and Amsterdam in 2015. Each year, the president distinguishes about 3,000 people, about one-third military and two-thirds civilian. But over the years, critics say the significance of the award has been watered down somewhat because too many people receive it. It's a discreet symbol that's easy to miss. A small red mark pinned on a lapel brands an exclusive elite, the recipients of the Legion of Honor. But don't underestimate the power of the rosette. It's the ultimate status symbol. These days, the Legion of Honor counts some 93,000 members. Is that too many? President Emmanuel Macron certainly thinks so. When he was elected, he vowed to drastically reduce the number of people given the Legion of Honor. 
this in order to restore the award's initial value, merit, a value philosophers say can get lost in the modern world. On confond la réussite et les mérites. Au lieu de chercher derrière, on se dit, bah voilà, celui qui a gagné de l'argent, qui a réussi politiquement, qui a une notoriété, une célébrité euh, dans les médias, alors il doit avoir du mérite, donc on va l'honorer. Et ça, évidemment, c'est un mirage. Maintaining the Legion's luster also means stripping it from those who have fallen from grace. That was the case of British fashion designer John Galliano following an anti-Semitic rant, cyclist Lance Armstrong in the wake of a doping scandal, or Hollywood film producer Harvey Weinstein after accusations of rape and sexual harassment. President Bashar al-Assad gave his back after France participated in airstrikes against Syria, though many wondered why he had it in the first place. And then there are those who say the award is a mere trinket and refuse to be part of the exclusive club. Jean-Paul Sartre, beloved actor Bourville, Simone de Beauvoir, or more recently, the economist Thomas Piketty, who said it's not up to the government to decide what's honorable. Many of you had questions about France's top honors, like Alfonso Prado, who wanted to know about the difference between honors for the military and civilians. Well, the military has its own separate award system that we don't have time to get into. But when it comes to the top national awards, like the Legion of Honor, there's no distinction. However, traditionally, top military figures have been laid to rest here at Les Invalides. Big estate funerals are held here as well. They're known as Hommage National. It's an extreme distinction of honor that's highly codified. Well, once again, it's the president who decides, and it's the president who delivers the eulogy at the state funeral. Recent state funerals have been held for the resistant Hubert Germain, the actor Jean-Paul Belmondo, the singer Charles Aznavour, uh, the president Jacques Chirac, the former minister Simone Veil, as well as the victims of the November 13th terrorist attacks. Another question now from El Diablo, who wanted to know whether more honors are awarded posthumously or does it even make a difference? Well, to quote the famous French author Marcel Pagnol, the first quality of a hero is to be dead and buried. But the truth is, it's really hard to measure the legacy of someone until after they're dead. And that begs the question, does a nation even need heroes in the first place? To dig a little deeper, I'm joined by Heather Stimler, the uh, creator and editor of Secrets of Paris, an insider's guide to the capital in English. So you're originally from the States, but you've been here in France for quite some time. So you've got a unique insider's perspective. What qualities do you think it takes to be considered a national hero here in France? I think the French definitely have their own version of what appeals to them in a hero. The French are very unique in that they really love the underdog. They like the person who overcame huge um, challenges, rags to riches stories. Even though they obviously have their war heroes and their soldiers, uh, the resistance fighters and all that, they also like the, the little guys who are sticking it to the man, like Abbe Pierre, who fought uh, to help the homeless and the poor people. And you've also got uh, comedians like Coluche, who again started the soup kitchen, the Resto du Coeur. You don't have as many of these. In fact, as far as I can tell, there are no great heroes in France who are billionaires and you know, great industrialists who made lots of money. For them, you know, it's, it's great if their heroes eventually become rich, but they have to still stay close to the people and close to their, uh, to their roots. Some people considered national heroes here in France can raise eyebrows abroad. For instance, the late rocker Johnny Holiday. Why do you think he was so appreciated? You know, that always confounded me for so long. I think as an American, we we're just like, we don't understand who is this guy. But what I learned over time, you know, he, the French people today really grew up with him. Again, like he overcame great challenges. He was like the regular guy. He was like the cool guy you'd have a drink with. And even after he became famous, uh, basically the Elvis of France, uh, he's, he still stayed like one of the people. Sometimes there can be a consensus around who's considered a national hero. For instance, we're in front of a statue of Georges Clemenceau, a, a hero from the First World War. But sometimes it can be a little bit trickier. For instance, Napoleon Bonaparte. How do the French deal with his loaded legacy? Uh, with debates, lots of debates. The French deal with everything by debating it. Uh, but I, th I think Napoleon has been controversial from the start. 
I mean, he did also start out as the rags to riches, you know, and he really created and nurtured that myth of himself as like one of the little people coming up. And he was a real hero of the revolution. He did so many things for France, the Code Civil, uh, all of the laws for the first time written down so that everybody knew what their rights were. That was him. But he also, in many people's mind, went too far. So he became the megalomaniac, the, the person whose ego and whose thirst for power uh, took over, not to mention you know, wanting to reestablish colonies in the Caribbean, reestablishing slavery, uh, very questionable today. So he is very controversial. And the French decided we are going to honor the great things he did while not ignoring some of these more complicated histories. A lot of countries pay tribute to esteemed men and women, but why do you think nations need heroes in the first place? I think it unites people behind this idea. That's why it's so important to have a diversity of heroes. It really gives people an idea of what, what the country values. And that's why over history we've changed so much from it just being war heroes. Uh, and now we, we honor scientists. The French love their scientists, like Jacques Cousteau and Louis Pasteur. Um, and obviously another woman in the Pantheon, Marie Curie. I think it's a way that we say what's important to us. So it's no longer just courage or fighting. It's also just excellence in your field and, and being outspoken for something that's important to you. Heather, thank you so much for being with us today on French Connections Plus. You're welcome. There are all sorts of other ways that exceptional people can be recognized in France. Cities like Paris hand out medals of honor every year, and then statues are raised. Schools, parks, streets, metro stops are named after distinguished citizens as well. National heroes can be a source of inspiration and an important reminder to dream big, work hard, and persevere through adversity. These days, a lot of national heroes are sports stars, like the members of the 2018 World Cup winning national football team or Olympic medalists. But in France, there's also a certain fascination with the anti-hero. People like the businessman Bernard Tapie or the singer Serge Gainsbourg. People who were provocative, sometimes had a run-in with the law, but ultimately loved life and were loved for that. That's all the time we have for this show. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget, you can always tweet your own questions at Flavio Minot or reach out on social media. And we'll see you soon for another episode of French Connections Plus.